everybody, welcome to the Law Doc Way. I'm Jessica, and today's video is going to be homeschool favorites. Now, I'm going to be sharing all of our homeschool favorites from Emily's sixth grade year, so from our 2023 2024 homeschool year, and like the things that really, really stuck out as top resources. Now, as always, our favorites typically include some books, some games, and some additional things. Books and games tend to be the resources we use the most. They also tend to be our favorites. So that is what I'm going to start with. Um, and then again, I'll show you some additional things that just really kind of stood out this year. The first book series is the Who Headquarters book series. So this includes the who was, the what was, and the where was, or where is, where are books. We really, really love them. They're probably one of our top resources or the thing we use the most in our homeschool. Emily has loved them from the time that she could refer to them as big head books. So probably since she was four or five. Um, and we started writing mini units to go along with them because they were such a favorite and something we used so frequently in our homeschool. This particular homeschool year, we really enjoyed the what was the age of exploration along with our exploration study. But this one was probably one of our favorite reads from the series um, because it sparked some really, really fantastic conversations between Emily and I. And that is something that really stood out in our sixth grade year that I can't physically show you um, is the conversations that we had. I talked more about that in the reflections video that I did last week, which I will link up here in case you want to see more about kind of how our homeschool year went. Um, but that is definitely why this one stood out among all of the ones that we read. Emily's personal top favorite book series was Wilder Lore. I have the first three here. Um, she has the fourth one somewhere in her room. She's rereading the series. She absolutely fell in love with the characters, with the books. In fact, she read them. She listened to them. She's reading them again. Um, but each time she tells me that she, there's more coming out, but they're coming out like one a year. But each time she reads them, she tells me like, is it normal to be sad that a book series is over, even though I've already read it and I know how it's going to end? Like she really, really loved that series. I haven't read it yet, but that was her personal favorite. Um, and it is on my reading list so that I have more to converse with her about. Um, the book series or the two book series that she loved so much she did talk me into reading were City Spies and Explorer Academy, both of which were fantastic. Um, she is reading, I believe, the fifth City Spies now. I've only read the first three. Um, I think the fifth one is the new one. It's Manhattan, whichever one the Manhattan one is, is what she's reading currently. Um, and we have made it through a handful of the Explorer Academy together. I think the first five. And there are seven. So a ton of us to read for us to read. Emily's read them all, but she wanted me to read them too. So we've made it through, I believe five of the seven of those. But those were kind of the book series that she loved so much. We read together. Um, and I give them both two thumbs up. So fantastic books. Okay. We're going to move along to games. Um, the game that became like the family favorite was past the pandas because it is so quick and easy. Like you only need a handful of dice and that's it. Like there's, you don't need anything else. You just need a handful of dice. So it doesn't take up a lot of space. It's super easy to learn because basically you have four options for rolling. You can roll water, which just evaporates and disappears. Bamboo, a panda, which you just pass to the next player or a blank tile or blank dice, which you keep. The bamboo, you just have to try to roll more bamboo than the person who rolled previous to you. Um, if not, then you get the difference. So like if they rolled two and you rolled one, they would give you one of their bamboo. But it's super quick to play. It's super easy to learn. It plays well with, I would say, three or more players. It does say you can play with two, but we find it not nearly as much fun when just two of us play. But I love it because it can fit in my purse. I can take it on the go. We can play it while we're waiting at the restaurant. It's a quick, easy game to teach new friends or like if we're over with family or whatever. And it plays up to five players. So you can have people join in. Um, it's just been super, 
it's just been a really super fun game. Like we've played this, this is hands down been the game we've played the most in the past year. Now to follow that up with probably the second most played games this year, um, have been genius square and genius star. Now, both of these games can be played as single player games or as two player games, which I love. Um, Emily also loves that because games like this, I typically tend to be better at than her. So the fact that she can play them one player and get better at them is a win for her. Um, and I love these kind of like abstract puzzle building games. They're my favorite. And it kind of has like that Tetris feel. Anyway, it, it makes us all very, very happy. You roll the dice, you put like little blocks in the way, um, which kind of feels like Battleship because of the the graph or grid that you're building here. And then you have to fit all of the other pieces in. And there's, I don't even remember how many possibilities. It's a lot. Like 62,208 possible puzzles to complete because of the different combinations when you roll the dice. I don't think we've ever, if we have ever done the same puzzle twice, we didn't know we were doing the same puzzle. Like it feels like a new fresh game every time you play it. And if you're going to start with one, the genius square is the easier because it's a square grid where genius star is very similar in gameplay. Um, there's more possibilities though. You have 165,888 possible puzzles because it's star versus square, but it also makes it slightly more difficult to fill a star puzzle versus a square puzzle. Um, so this one they recommend for eight up. This one they recommend for six up. Both are fantastic. If you want a challenge, get star. If you want something a little bit easier, you have younger kids, get square. But Emily and I have loved those. Like we have played them constantly this year. If just her and I are sitting down to play a game, we're typically picking one of those up. Along with that, we have been playing games at dinner. Um, we like to play trivia games or guessing games over dinner because it's one of the few times of the day that all of us are sitting at a table where we're sitting still together. Um, and so it's been really fun to just kind of add in something that brings us together while we're eating. And the two top resources or games that we've played the most during that time have been the Professor Noggin. Uh, this happens to be Explorers because that's what we were playing most recently since that's what we were learning. Um, and they have easy and hard questions on the back of them. And all you have to do when you play is you just roll a dice and then you ask that question. So they're easy to just leave sitting on the dining room table. We sit down for dinner. One of us picks up a dice. We roll the dice. We ask the question, you know, if they get it right, they get to keep it. So you don't like it. You don't need a lot of room to play. You know, you just need to not in our household talk with your mouth full. Um, so we take turns, but we can get through probably six to nine cards a night and we will play through the whole deck on easy. Um, and then we will play through the whole deck on hard. So it's kind of like we can go through the deck twice. So that will last us probably about a month per Professor Noggin trivia deck. Um, and we have like 32, but that has just been a really fun way to get in some extra learning, to have fun. We like trivia games as a family anyway. So it's been a way to connect, um, and kind of like end our day because dinner's the last thing we do, you know, like end our day on a connected fun kind of note. And along that same lines, we also started this year with guess and 10, um, over dinner because you just need you know, the guessing card. So you just need a stack of cards and you're just trying to guess whatever it is. Um, kind of same principle. We just leave, this comes in the box with all the cards. We just stand it up on the dining room table. We just pull the next one. We typically can get through about nine a night. So one of these will last us probably two weeks. Cause there's not quite as many. You can't go through it. I mean, you could go through it twice, but there's not like easy and hard, like the professor noggin. So we were going through a different topic a about every two to three weeks. Um, and there's so many topics to choose from. This is States of America. We have things that go, um, food around the world, underwater animals, animal planet, 
countries of the world. Deadly dinosaurs. Legendary landmarks. Let's see. Inspiring professions. And then we also have, I don't know why they're not here. I didn't grab them. Um, sports, which is the new one that we just got for the summer. We have Marvel and Disney as well. Um, there may even be one or two. I'm still missing because I think we have 15 total now. So more than enough between Professor Noggins and Guess Intense, you know, for to keep us going. But that being said, if you have a fantastic guessing or trivia game that doesn't require a lot of components, would love to add even more to our dinner time game playing. So please let me know down in the comments because you can never have enough. Okay, a few of the additional resources now. Emily and I have done poetry tea time for years, um, but I had found in the past year or two that it was becoming more difficult, um, especially as I started my health journey because she would want like more sugary things because poetry tea time is a treat time for her. Um, and so we were not ever drinking the same thing. So it was kind of becoming not a, I mean, it's not a pain, but it just wasn't as easy as it was before. So I finally got us these adorable tea for one sets. And it is literally like your own little saucer, your own little teapot and your own teacup. And it just stacks like this all nice and neat in my cabinet. But then when it's time for us to have poetry tea time, I can just pull two of these out. We each have one and I can make like, if we're going to have pink lemonade, I can make, you know, regular pink lemonade for her. I can make like a sugar-free light one for me, or if she wants, you know, a sweeter drink and I want actual tea, like it's easy because now we can just kind of each have our own drink of choice and we just, you know, pour for ourselves, which she also loves because before, um, our teapot when it was full was a lot larger and a lot heavier and so she was kind of scared to pour her own tea She would be like mom will you do it for me and now she 100% can handle it herself and pour her own tea because it's lighter smaller She feels more in control So that has been a huge win For multiple reasons because we can both drink what we want now It makes tea time even easier for me, which I love because it means I'm willing to do it more often um, and it's made her a little more independent. So wins all the way across the board on that. With tea time in mind, um, and poetry in mind, we love to do poetry tea times during or around holidays. She loves it when I get, you know, like Valentine's candy for Valentine's day or green cupcakes for St. Patrick's day or some sort of red, white, and blue cookie for 4th of July. She's just always loved the themed snacks and the themed tea times, but I was finding it again, difficult to source poetry books for each and every holiday. So I finally picked up two that cover a lot of different seasons and holidays, and I can kind of pull together a tea time on just about anything, like in the snap of a finger. So one is this Poems for All Seasons, and it's Julie Andrews, which I love. Um, it's Poems and Songs to Celebrate the Year. So the way this one is kind of split is by month. So like in January, there is New Year's Day, New Year's Resolutions, Martin Luther King Day, I Dream, um, Cardinal the Snowflake, Kitten Skating, and Happy Winter. February, you have Groundhog, New Year's Day, and Chinese New Year. Um, I Made My Dog a Valentine and a Valentine, George Washington's birthday, Abraham Lincoln's birthday. We cannot all be Washingtons and Lincolns. You get the idea. So if I wanted to do something for President's Day, I mean, there's three poems right here in this one book that are back to back because they were genius and separated it by months of the year um, that I know we can read during our tea time at the very least. Like even if I don't have anything else, this one book will give me three poems to read. To go along with that, this other book, which is Days to Celebrate, it's 366 days a leap year, is split separately or similarly too. So you have like January, February, March, and we'll just pick um, May, for example, there's mother to son. Um, there was an old man with a beard, Memorial Day. So they give you a calendar at the beginning of each month. And then the calendar kind of goes along with the poems that they share. 
So these two have become staples in our poetry tea time this year because I can just pull these two out and pull our tea time for one pot. And I know that without really a ton of thought or even effort for me, I can have a fun tea time that Emily's gonna love around a holiday or theme. Like I don't have to try to worry about thinking super far in ahead and making sure I get the books from the library or whatever. I know I'm gonna have enough. So favorite of hers, because we had more tea times. Favorite of mine, because it made my life so much easier. And again, we were able to connect and enjoy tea time more because of it. Um, also a favorite this year has been this question and answer a day journal. When Emily was younger, we had one that was like three years worth of questions. Um, it was smaller and I would ask her the questions at bedtime and I would write the answers for her. We had it in our morning basket for a while. Then we had it in our bedtime basket this year. I wanted something that she would do more independently. Um, and something that was kind of creative writing for her. And this has been that. So it doesn't have dates. It just has here. I'll turn to the back where she hasn't finished it yet. Um, it just has like day. So like day 365 and you write the date so you can start anytime. Like you could start today and run it for 365 days, which I also loved because we were starting it at the beginning of the school year, which wouldn't have been January 1st, obviously. Um, anyway, some of the questions really made her think and some were just funny. So I liked that. So if you had to leave your house and never come back, what three things would you bring with you and why? Uh, let's see. What is something you would like to do in the mountains? Climb, ski, hike, camp, bird watch, and why? What would you do if you could be invisible for one day? If someone gave you money, could you, if someone gave you money, you could only spend on someone else. What would you do with the money and why? What is your family favorite tradition? What do you like about this tradition? What is something that you dream of doing someday? Uh, what is a toy that you wish you owned and why do you want that toy? What is the best thing about being a kid? If you could go back in time, what is one thing you would change? Uh, what do you like to do during school recess and why? Who do you talk to the most and what do you guys talk about? Do you like spiders? Why or why not? So it was just kind of a very wide range of questions. Um, and it got her, you know, to write a small kind of paragraph each day. So she started her days with this um, as independent work. It's a great way to get her to practice some creative writing, to get her to also kind of be mindful. Um, and it was perfect for independent because she was doing this when I was in the gym most mornings. So again, it was a win for both of us, which is why it made the favorites list. Along the same lines of independent work is mind benders. These have been a favorite from ours. Let's see, this is level four. So I don't know, four or five years, however many years it's taken us to get to level four. Um, I think we started level one in kindergarten, maybe. Maybe she did that through kindergarten and first. But I love them. I love that it makes her think literally outside of the box. Um, I love that they have so many and that it gets more and more difficult as each level goes, that they kind of build on themselves. I love that it's deductive thinking skills. I feel like that is something especially, I think that that's something all kids can use more, but especially I feel like as we get into the tween years, some of that like common sense kind of, I don't know, it disappears, it becomes mush. So I love that they not only have little kids, but they have big kids so that she can keep growing with it. Um, this is grades three to six. She almost finished level four. So we'll move on to level five next year because I love it that much. If you are not familiar with mind benders, I'll show you an example real quick. It does also have an answer key, which is fantastic. So basically one page is a mind bender. There are kind of things up here that you read and then you use the clues that they give you as deductive reasoning to cross off ones that can't be possible and figure out what is possible. So let me start with one in the beginning. This would be the very first one. So a boulder, a cobbler and a pebble cobble in a pebble are all in a gorge, a lake and a valley. Read the clues to find out where each rock is located. So this is what kind of the box looks like because you only have three and then they give you a clue. The rock in the valley is larger than the cobble and the cobble is not in the lake. So you automatically know that the cobble is not in the valley or the lake. 
So it has to be in the gorge and then use process of elimination for the rest. Um, and like I said, it gets more and more difficult because this is what the last puzzle and level four looks like. Um, but again, there is an answer key. So that is a win for me as well. And those have been favorites forever. They will probably stay favorites. That is another thing um, that she does independently along with her journal in the morning when I'm working out. Um, and then the last thing for independent that absolutely became a favorite the last half of this year were our discovery decks. They were the perfect way to start the days. They were the perfect way to get five more minutes of independent work out of Emily that she enjoys because they were just her watching a video. Um, it was a fun way for her and for me to expose her to a lot of different topics and then kind of see where she springboarded off of based off of those. Um, so these were the three things typically that she was doing in the morning when I was working out was her journal, the mind benders and watching a discovery deck video. It became the perfect amount of independent work for her. It became the perfect kind of subject based because most of the discovery decks were geography or science or history. So she was getting a lot of that in. Um, she was getting some creative writing in with the journal. And then I feel like mind benders is deductive reasoning and also like kind of spatial mathematical. So she was getting a little bit of everything with these um, three things. And even if the rest of the day went crazy and we didn't get anything else done, I felt like she had a good base for her day. She got something accomplished. She was happy because she loved these things. Um, and I felt really great with what she learned in like 20, 30 minutes of time. And then typically I had gotten my workout in. So I was also a much nicer person. Um, and so even if we just did that and then ran out the door to run errands or whatever, it was like, okay, I got a workout in. She got these few things done. Our day started out fantastic. We were ready for whatever else got thrown at us. So it was kind of a win there. Um, another like favorite has always been unit studies. We love unit studies. We do them in our home school pretty much primarily. That's how we learn this year. Our personal favorite unit study ended up being traveling the parks. Now we've done, we've dabbled in traveling the parks on and off for years, but it was our favorite this year because we got to do it. And then also go on a cross country road trip and hit eight new national parks that we hadn't visited yet. So this unit study really lends itself well to being able to be brought to life. Um, and even if you can't actually go to the national parks, you can still bring them to life because there's videos included and there's just all this stuff that feels like you're there even when you're not there, but being able to actually be there and have the unit study and kind of par partner them and pair them together was fantastic and a favorite of all of ours. Like hands down that month that we traveled, that we did the, the unit study, that we saw it in person, that we brought it to life, that we got to talk to the rangers, you know, go on some of the guided hikes. It, it was an experience that we will never forget. Um, and I can't wait to continue to do more because we still, I think we've decided we've been to 15 out of 63 national parks. So that means there's still a lot left on the list for us. And then the last thing, I don't have anything to show you because I literally cannot hold it on camera um, and it be seen is one of our bows because archery became a favorite of all of ours this year. Um, it is something that we can do as a family and we can like kind of compete, but we're also not competing. Um, you know, like we can all compete at our own level, which makes it even because any other like sport or activity that we tried to do, somebody was better at it than somebody else. Um, you know, Kevin can run faster. Like when we we're doing the five case, he's a faster runner in general. Um, there's just, you know, different things that we're all physically able to do with archery. Like for example, a lot of the archery shoots that we do have a stake in the ground. I um, mean, they're different color stakes. So like the youth stake is at one distance from the target where the women's is at a different distance from the target and the men's is at another distance. They also have separate stakes for traditional, which is what we do traditional shooting versus like compound shooting, um, which is the bows that have, you know, like the wheels and all the sights and, you know, extra, you also pull back and it kind of lets off a little bit. Um, our traditional bows, don't have any of that. We shoot recurve, 
Um, hopefully we will also shoot longbow soon. We will see um, if we're gonna add that. But for now, we all shoot a recurve bow. And so it is essentially a riser or a handle, two limbs and a string, and then you put an arrow on it. Uh, so we have three different stakes when we shoot shoots. And at home, I have like those little yard landscape survey flags, if you will, and we all have a different color. And so I can put the flags there and we can like compete at our own levels because it's like she has her stake, I have my stake, Kevin has his stake. We can compete with each other because, you know, we like a little competition in our family um, and see who can score higher. Um, we went so far as to build our range in our backyard. We have seven 3D targets now because we love it that much. So it has just become a fantastic sport for us as a family. It has also become something that I have seen Emily grow so much because of like between archery and 4-H and the shoots that she did with them and the shoots that she's done with us. I can't explain it. Like her confidence, her um, ability to regulate her emotions, uh, her concentration, her willingness to do math. Like she would fight me anytime I'd ask her to do math before. And now she will volunteer to keep score um, for everybody. When we do most of the shoots, you have to keep score and keep a running total. Um, and she'll volunteer for it most of the time, not all of the time, but most of the time. And so there's just been so much growth that I have seen in her because of it. Not to mention, like I said, we all really, really fallen in love with it. Um, so I'm excited to continue to do it um, and see where else it might lead. So there you have it. Those are our favorites from Emily's sixth grade, 2023, 2024 homeschool year. Always some books, always some games, and then just some extra resources that added enchantment to our homeschool year. But now I would love to hear from you. What were some of your favorites from this past homeschool year? Let me know down in the comments.